Dear friends, among the people that I met during my very first days in Cleveland were Dick and Sandy Friedman and their blended family. It seemed that the whole congregation was enamored of, proud of, and had a share in their story. It was romantic and hopeful, comforting and healing, proportional and deeply satisfying. As two of the most active involved temple members with an extended family of dear friends, all of whom were also wonderfully active members, they seemed to include us all in their embrace. I remember the house and the neighborhood on Lanark Lane. I remember meeting Randy and Wendy, Brian and David, and thinking how brave they all were, how strong and resilient they must be. Brian was about 16 years old and on his way to confirmation. He was smart, funny, good looking. And if I am remembering correctly, there was something challenging about him, something rebellious, unconventional, even provocative. He was also exquisitely sensitive and painfully complex, which he managed to conceal behind his inimitable bravado. He graced our world with the gifts of his mind, even while he wrestled with the existential questions of his soul. We will never know, but we can imagine in his heart of hearts he might have wished to lift his eyes to the mountains and to seek the source of his help, as our people have done throughout the generations. My help comes from Adonai, maker of heaven and earth. Es Source of all life, author of our existence, our lives are filled many times with suffering and pain. But we pray, O oh God, that your light not be hidden from our eyes. You are, O oh God, indeed our light and our hope. In this hour of parting from our beloved Brian, we cherish 
in the too narrow lifespan, the few years that were allotted to him. But we thank you, O God, for his life. It had meaning and virtue. May courage and wisdom be granted now to his sorrowing family. May Brian's spirit live on, influencing our hearts to draw together, to draw near to all humankind in joy, in death, and in life. The sage Ecclesiastes teaches, for everything there is a season. Lechosman a season, a time for every experience under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted. A time to tear down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to grieve and a time to dance. A time to throw stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to pause from embracing. A time to seek, a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to discard. A time to tear, a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak. Now is our time to remember, to remember one dear and precious to us. Dear friends, as we uh, conclude our service shortly, family uh, wants me to express to you how appreciative they are of your presence here today on this frozen cold February day. Your nearness brings them warmth and it reminds them of all that is good in life. If you wish, at the conclusion of our service here, you may join us for a service of interment at Mayfield Cemetery, which will be immediately followed by Shiva gathering at the family home at 2201 Acacia Park Drive, Building South. You're invited, if you wish, to honor Brian's memory, to do so with a gift of tzedakah, of support, generosity to the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation. And of course, the family suggests, if you can, to offer to them, well, really, any memories and your own tributes, your own gestures of condolence in the days and weeks to come. Famed 19th century author Stephen Crane, in one of his most poignant and yet briefest pieces of literature ever, wrote the following poem to which I want to draw your attention. He wrote, In the desert, I saw a creature who, squatting upon the ground, held his own heart in his hands, and ate of it. I said, Is it good, friend? It is bitter. Bitter, he answered. But I like it. Because it is bitter, and because it is my heart. I found that poem once thoughtfully inscribed by a prescient teacher in my older brother's high school yearbook. And I was reminded of it again as I sat with Brian's grieving family. After all, this self-revealing portrait in Stephen Crane's words was written by a man who lived on the earth for too short of a time. He knew in that time tremendous creativity the taste of exaltation and goodness alongside bitterness and pain, the absorption of trauma affecting his family and community, the hopes invested in him as a young man, and because of his unique sensitivities. Stephen Crane also knew a good heart. But for a reason that may be elusive and beyond what's there, the subject of his poem, one of God's own creations, took actions that furthered him, furthered him from demonstrating how much love his heart possessed. I think we're grieving a similar man today. Brian Allen Friedman died at 53 years old. He too was a sensitive and caring individual, difficult to describe yet somehow unforgettable. He was a Jewish man, a man whose heart 
had goodness and possibility, whose fierce loyalty could be a blessing to a friend, and of whom it is difficult, so difficult to accept, that someone so young is now gone from our midst. But as we look within, let us be reminded today of Brian's most hopeful values, the things that made him laugh, the memories, especially early in his life, that contain none of today's despair or yesterday's pain. For as our prayers teach us, we, each of us, are more than a memory slowly fading into the darkness. With our lives, somehow we give life, and so something of us never dies. We grieve today with Sandy and Dick on a day that we hope brings them a modicum of healing. It is always, always backwards to be in the presence of your son's casket. And it has been said that no matter how much a life includes struggle or hardship to connect, that there is certainly no quiet that can compare to the quiet in one's home after the death of a loved one. Let us pledge to be a source of sympathy lived out loud and give his parents' love vocalized in open encouragement unmistakable to Dick and Sandy during a rather vulnerable time. Our sympathies extend today to Brian's siblings, to David, Randy and his Susan, Wendy and her Stephen. We extend our grief and sympathies to nephew Michael and nieces Alexis, Rachel and Michelle. And I've only just met some of them. But I have already started to sense the finality that knowing that Brian is no longer alive hurts their hearts very deeply. Let us be a community of meaning and shared purpose to each of them today and always. Because of the family's long history at Fairmount Temple, as Cantor acknowledged, a past winner of the Duber Family of the Year Award at our synagogue. Because of that, I had the opportunity to see in recent days the various things saved by Anche Chesed, our temple, from their lives. Things that included Brian, including something I found last night in his own handwriting. His written description of the meaning of his Bar Mitzvah Torah portion. It may interest some of you to know that Brian read from the Torah from chapter 32 of Genesis, which, in a true spark of meaning, is about the challenges that Jacob has coming to reconcile with his brother Esau, with whom he had a rather raw and upsetting conflict in relationship. Mostly brought about by Jacob's own aggressive and harmful tendencies. In relating to this, as he read about Jacob's concerns for how safe it would be to encounter his brother again, Brian wrote, If you fear someone because you did something to make them mad, take precaution. But see if they've forgiven you too. Give them a chance. Give them a chance, he wrote. When Brian was born on no less memorable a day than December 25th, in 1964, Los Angeles, he was the first chance at fatherhood and family life for Dick Friedman, and sadly the only for Marlene, Aleha Shalom whose tragic death in her 20s due to a cerebral hemorrhage altered the course of Brian's life considerably. It was a confusing and challenging time as the family resettled in Columbus and later here in Cleveland. Brian was seven years old when Sandy and Dick married, I believe in the study that we gathered in yesterday to speak about Brian's life. But that marriage was to become a source of stability and loving care for Brian. As Dick and Sandy agreed on core practices and principles, including for all their children, the memory 
and values of their lost first spouses, and the desire to be one unified family for their daughter and each of their sons. Brian loved the things that many boys love, playing basketball and football and wiffle ball outdoors, and most especially the family's Atari video game set. He could be gregarious and happy and determined and competitive. Just thinking of Brian being able to participate in activities that brought him joy is healing because it reminds us of the meaning that a portion of his life carried for him and always will. We can picture him cross-country running or the way his competitive streak helped him and his very talented tennis player. We can remember how smart he was or how he enjoyed seeing movies or reading books and this too is a source of a smile. Randall told me that his brother had a marvelous and carefully kept set of DC comic books, the envy of his brothers and other childhood friends. David told me about how Brian loved to read novels, fiction, and watch funny movies such as Monty Python or Benny Hill on TV. But there is bitterness as well, as we recall that during his mid-teenage years, the diagnosis for Brian of a challenging strain of juvenile diabetes. That also altered the tra trajectory of his life, and certainly his spirit and his resilience. He often complained of pain and discomfort, physically, and one might say, because of his sensitivity, spiritually. Even environments that he once enjoyed, his teachers, his coaches, his rabbis who were close to him, including Rabbi Lelyveld, with whom he sparred intellectually, one of Rabbi Lelyveld's favorite pursuits, and with Rabbi Eisenberg, with whom he enjoyed a class at Temple where they watched films. Each of these adult figures, and certainly his parents, began to see a different Brian emerge, a more sullen and beaten down young man, combative with Sandy, who told me that although she always admired his independence, his way of expressing that he was going to do things his way and only his way could be hurtful too. He really felt that he had been wronged, and though he didn't know who to blame, he let everyone around him bear those burdens. One of the only people who didn't get that share of his intensity was Brian's grandma Esther who seemed to be able to walk through the raindrops of Brian's storms. Everyone else bore the brunt of what would appear now was agony and depression. Still, Brian managed to graduate successfully at Orange High School and proceed through confirmation and religious school graduation at Temple. He loved sports, including beleaguered Cleveland teams with which he grew up. And he brought with him to college a great collection of music that he loved, including Black Sabbath, Steely Dan, Kiss, and other popular musicians. He matriculated into the Ohio State University, focused his studies there on hotel and restaurant management, but never pursued that career. Brian didn't focus on one particular area. Much of his career, his skillful ability to turn on a sales persona, made him a capable insurance agent particularly for several years at Nationwide. Later, he worked for a series of companies in the home remodeling field, particularly companies specializing in helping to rehab homes after traumatic storms had turned people's lives upside down. It would seem that Brian in these fields was attracted to helping people, which probably he could have done in any number of fields with enough talent that he had, but discipline that he did not have particularly in that portion of the home rehab business, I'm told he met some unsavory characters whom Brian didn't admire and made him instinctually switch jobs often, and this caused concern for his parents as to whether he might be taken advantage of. But Brian didn't seem to absorb or emulate or get caught up in the web of people who would cause his family hardship or consternation. Here, his being somewhat elusive was an advantage to him. Brian always seemed to have a penchant, though, for finding friends in unique settings and remaining loyal to them. 
many since childhood. He was empathetic, and he connected with those who were more vulnerable than him readily. It is difficult to know whether this was of his desire to once again be someone's older sibling, a patron, or just that he could be a good caregiver when he wanted to, because he did have an open heart. In recent years, particularly as Sandy has been a model for us all of tremendous resilience, Brian began to reach out to her in a way that was healing and a true blessing. He confessed to her how much he respected her and how much she meant to him. He sent her gifts to share love and admiration as she has made a truly remarkable comeback. This brings us gratitude because... It's an example of his desire, his striving for wholeness, even in his adult life, to be a source of humanity. This was not true for everyone. Not everyone got such healing strands from him, particularly when he lived in Dallas and later in Colorado. His contact with people, many of whom were once close in his life, including immediate family, of course, but also friends, friends who were raised with him like, like cousins or siblings. For them, contact was more intermittent, and these people missed Brian, the one they knew, and now they always will. There is a teaching by contemporary Rabbi Jacob Shankman, who wrote that inside each and every one of us is a hallowed sanctuary where our loved ones, who touched our lives permanently, now abide. When we look within, we can kind of find there a spiritual immortality from them. They are near to us. They talk to us. They kibitz with us and tell us tales. When we encounter them in this way, we are soothed in our pain and ennobled in our sorrow. I share this teaching in this mournful morning in February as a tribute to the essence of simplicity in what we are here to do. We are here where Brian grew up in Cleveland, where he did spend some good years. We gather here to speak words of honor and memory and truth and honesty. Let us as well have each of our gestures of condolence illumined, not just by the Shiva candle, but by the warmth of his effort to make a life of meaning. Today, when we look within, let us find there a kind and loving soul, one who could be determined and competitive with life and each of the obstacles that it threw at him, but at the same time, be truly vulnerable to the elements. Brian was human. Human. As he wrote of our ancestor Jacob, if you are afraid that you might have done something to make others mad, Take precaution, but also see if they might open their heart to forgive you. Give them a chance, he wrote. Let's give Brian a chance. Humanize him. His life had meaning. It mattered. He lived and loved and struggled and strived. May his memory guide us forward in blessing. Amen. I invite you all now to please rise. Ni 
ich mat, Baruch, Ben Raphael und Miriam, Shalach, Leolam, Baal Rachamim, Yast Yirehu Viseit Eknafav, Leolamim, Et nishmato Adonai unachalato Veyanuach Veshalom Al mishkavo Compassionate God, eternal spirit of the universe, grant perfect rest in your sheltering presence to Brian Allen Friedman, who has entered eternity. O God of mercy, let him find refuge in the shadow of your wings and let his soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting life. God is his inheritance. May he rest in peace and let us say.